Hello, my name is Mike Parr. I'm a student in Newcastle, and today I'm talking about microbial community surrounding the plant roots. Uh, this is very interesting when you think about organic farming, which relies on productivity of the soil itself, and when you're thinking about reducing agrochemical usage. A bit about me, I'm a PhD student at Newcastle, I've just said. Uh, I'm looking at how um, different farming techniques that have been previously be used in previous years uh, can affect the present microbial community. And my master's project was in a similar vein, um, looking at the effect of fungicides on microbial um, communities of leaves and seeing if we could make a design population by introducing different bacteria. Uh, I also interned in Norwich at John and Nez Centre, um, just getting hands-on experience with farming techniques. Um, just to bring up to speed what I'm talking about today, the microbial community um, is also referred to as microbiome. It, it's a community of bacteria, fungi, microanimals, and virus. Um, these communities are very small, but very large at the same time. So a single tablespoon of soil has about 50 billion different uh, organisms in it. Um, so there's a lot of interactions going on. Uh, microbial communities have a massive effect on their environment. So that your mood, uh, they exist in your gut, so they're producing neurotransmitters there and um, you can be happy or sad based on how they're feeling that day. Um, and then in agricultural systems, um, this can affect plant health um, and also crop yields, or it could be the difference between an area having food security or a farmer having a roof over their head. Um, the first thing is nitrogen fixation. Uh, nitrogen is an essential element of life. Um, soils that lack nitrogen and nitrates uh, have significantly lower productivity. Uh, one reason the nitrogen is essential is uh, because it's used in producing proteins and enzymes, uh, major ones being chlorophyll and rubisco, both of them are found in the photosynthesis pathway. Uh, so without that, the plant can't grow properly. Um, despite nitrogen being such a major part of our atmosphere, up to 70% of the air we breathe, uh, it's fairly inert. There's a triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms and the diatom. And this bond requires quite a lot of energy to break down, um, twice as much nearly as uh, oxygen oxygen atoms. Uh, very few organisms can actually work with nitrogen um, due to the energy requirements. Very few of them have the um, machinery needed to break it down. Um, so we're talking about a subset of the soil bacterial uh, population have the enzymes, um, but they're not just found in the soil, they're found in the um, root associated nodules that some plants can produce. So Fabiaceae, which is the family containing peas, beans, legumes, chickpeas, everything like that, uh, actually produces growths uh, just filled with um, nitrogen, nitrogen fixing bacteria. So it acts as a factory that's associated with the plants. So it's an in-house factory producing all these essential nutrients. Um, so we've, we've talked about the factories and now we've got to talk about the logistics. So um, mycorrhizal fungi are very important to the growth of plants. Uh, myco coming from the root word for fungus and rhizo meaning root. Um, roots are very expensive and they're relatively large, require nutrients, um, a lot of upkeep. So a plant has to redirect um, energy molecules to keep them going and these energy uh, this energy and molecules um being diverted could be used in the leaves themselves so to make the plant grow better stronger everything like that and they're going into the root system um they, the roots also form what's known as a nutrient depletion zone um an area surrounding the root that um just doesn't have the nutrients it used to um because the root itself has actively sucked up everything but it can. Um, so the plant is left with two options really. Um, grow continuously forever, uh, bearing in mind that you've got this overhead um, that will keep um, the plant growing as much as it could do, or you can just outsource the issue to someone else. Um, so this is where the mycorrhizal fungi come in. Um, using fungi is a very, very common and effective strategy. Um, 80 to 90 percent of land plants use it. Um, this association has uh, been going on for about half a billion years now, so it's obviously tried and tested at this point. Um, fungi use their hair-like root cells called hyphae um, to wander through the soil uh, in search of nutrients and water. 
um, you can see in this picture of a fungal network just, just shooting off into the distance uh, to find these pockets of nutrients and water. Um, so it's shown that um, in shoots just after germination, um, plants that have an associated uh, mycorrhiza fungi network have phosphorus levels of 230% over their peers that don't. Um, and a lot of orchids are actually fully reliant on this system uh, and they're unable to even germinate on themselves and they rely on parasitizing these fungal networks um, just for the basics in the early stage of their life cycle. Um, so this system is found in most plants. It's ancient, almost half a billion years old, as I just said. Um, and it's thought to have helped with the early colonization of land uh, by the first plants as they weathered down the rocks that the plants grew on and released minerals for them and um, half a billion years covering the entirety of land plant history um, gives a lot of time some interest in co-evolution to happen so we see these uh, this um, structure here called an arbuscule which is like an, a root system created by the fungi that's penetrating uh, the root cells of a plant and this allows for a massive massive increase in nutrient transfer directly into the plant and um, of course, not all microbes are friends, so some are under the right or wrong circumstances are, are pathogens. Um, for a plant, fighting pathogens is quite a rough ordeal. Um, it requires the redirection of resources from growth and repair and reproduction um, to defensive molecules. Uh, but some soils have a community that acts as a sort of immune system, so bolstering the internal immune system of the plant itself. Uh, keeping the plant pathogens in check before they become an issue by exerting competitive forces, co uh, competition for resources, and um, just creating an environment where they don't thrive as well. Uh, this keeps their population down, stops them creating diseases in the first place. Uh, some microbes even produce antimicrobial um, molecules. From the microbes' point of view, this makes sense. They have some level of tolerance of the molecule itself, so they produce tons and tons of it released into their local environment and everyone who can't tolerate it dies down so they have more access to resource, less competition. And um, the, uh, this means that they have more resources um, and the likelihood of disease for the plant then just plummets down because there are less microbes to um, cause the disease in the first place. Um, but now we have to ask ourselves why. Uh, the eternal question, why? Uh, why does the soul community do this? Life is inherently selfish. Um, you do things for your own survival. Why would these microbes produce molecules that benefit plant in the first place? Um, <clears throat> sure, bacteria need nitrates as well. So are the plants stealing from them? Uh, maybe that's what's happening. But as I said earlier, um, orchids act as a parasite on the fungal network, um, taking resources. And maybe the plants are just selfish and just stealing from what's already going on in the soil. But um, then we think about the arbuscule, the dedicated structure that uh, enhances nutrient transfer between mycorrhizae and um, the root itself. And that's the answer, it's transfer. Um, there's a back and forth between the soil community and the plant host. Um, and in very, very simple terms, the plant is buying these molecules off of the soil microbiome. And the currency is carbon. And plants are the best at one thing, and that's photosynthesis. They take energy from the sun, um, fix carbon in the atmosphere, and turn it into something more useful, like sugars, um, preliminary uh, molecules that can be turned into DNA or proteins. Um, you might have heard of the term carbon-based life form. And uh, the stuff's everywhere. Carbon is in every single um, cell in your body. Um, like plants can't capture nitrogen from the air uh, just because they haven't got the right tools. Fungi and most bacteria can't photosynthesize. So the plant can leverage this carbon in a way and invest in the microbiome and get what it needs to survive. Um, so here's quite a small but intimidating uh, table. It's just a list of the basic molecules that plants are known to produce. Um, some increase the population of every single um, member of a community, like the basic sugars, like glucose or amino acids, which are 
the basic building blocks of proteins. Um, some of the molecules can be more complex, so can only be utilized by a subset of the community that have the correct enzymes to break them down. So if a plant is able to increase the general population of the uh, microbial community itself, but is also then able to fine tune it and um, pick members of the community that do a function that benefits the plant itself so they can do exactly what it wants. Um, this is called a mutualistic relationship um, where both parties benefit in some way um, through the trade of nutrients or services. Um, there's a list of uh, services there that the, uh, the soil community can provide. And um, it really boils down to you scratch my back and I scratch yours. There's an exchange of uh, benefit there. Um, to understand uh, what this means to a plant, um, you really have to look at resource allocation. Um, bear in mind that every single molecule that the plant puts into the soil could have been used for growth or reproduction or repair. Um, instead, the plant is putting all their energy into making these molecules and then just pumping it into the soil. So you've got 20, 30, up to 50% of the uh, molecules then going into the ground. And um, the type and abundance of the molecules that the plant is putting into the soil is hard coded into plant DNA. Um, two plants of the same species, the same cultivar under the similar conditions tend to have very similar, if, if not identical, uh, microbial communities associated with the roots. Um, this isn't an accident or left up to chance, this is very much an intentional act, uh, action, uh, both on the plant side and um, evolutionary speaking. And um, the plant, despite having no brain whatsoever, uh, knows when it's getting a raw deal. So if it detects that the um, microbial community is not pulling its weight, it can reduce investment uh, into the soil community. And um, when the plant can do everything itself, why would it need to have this overperforming fungal network uh, when it's resistant can collect water, phosphorus, nitrates all by itself, uh, even metals? Uh, why would it need to have this fungal network in the first place? And nature is incredibly efficient. It's very, very brutal as well. Um, in phosphorus rich areas, we find that almost half of the uh, fungal hyphae are gone in comparison to phosphorus poor areas, uh, down from a surface area of one and a half to three quarters of a tennis court. And um, when the plant is able to, oh, sorry, um, it, it, we're going down from quite a large area to a relatively small area. And um, when you look at studies where the fertilizer has been added already, um, we see that the abundance of certain groups of root associated fungi uh, go down by about a third. And the plant has essentially said, thank you, I've had enough, uh, goodbye, I've got what I need already. And um, <clears throat> we know that the plant can get these functions from the soil itself already. So why are we adding fertilizer if uh, there's a detriment to the soil? So um, just think about where we use fertilizer, where we add fertilizer, we're talking our farms and gardens, and we aren't hurting our plants. In fact, that's how we get the, the largest yields is by adding fertilizer. Um, but we're reducing their ability to be self-sustainable in the long term. Um, to put this in a wider context, it takes a lot of energy to produce fertilizers. Often these require natural gas, different resources like that. Then you've got to transport them from factory to factory, maybe across the country, maybe even internationally. And um, that, that's a lot of emissions that are being produced before it even gets to the farmer's shed. Uh, and then once it gets to the farm, you're talking about big, big tractor, big engine running with diesel, um, spreading these chemicals. And then these fertilizers aren't all used by the plant itself. Um, they break down into nitrous oxide. And uh, I think it's one kilo of nitrous oxide is equivalent to 300 kilograms of CO2. And it lasts in the atmosphere for about a century, maybe a maybe hundred years or more. Um, so yeah, knowing why the micro, uh, knowing that the microbes uh, in the soil can do all that anyway, why bother using chemicals? We've already got the function there, uh, latent in the soil already. 
well, there's a big question for another day. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, here's the wake up.